train conductor made his way down the aisle, the forgetful Oliver Wendell Holmes saw him coming. The Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court reached into his pocket, then into his second pocket, then into a third pocket. By the time the conductor approached Mr. Holmes, he said, that's all right, Mr. Holmes. I know who you are. When you get home and find your ticket, just mail it in. Mr. Holmes replied, you don't understand. It's not the ticket I'm concerned about. It's where I'm going. <laughs> so often, we are on a track, on a train, that leads to teachers teaching towards obedience. It's like the teacher who says to the class, I expect you all to be independent problem solvers who will do exactly as I say. <laughs> With today's generation, when you teach towards obedience, too often you get resistance, rebellion, and out and out to defiance. The train we're going to be taking today, its destination is going to be to promote responsibility. You'll find that when you empower people and you promote responsibility, you will get obedience as a natural byproduct. We're going to need some kind of attention management approach. One of my favorites is give me five, meaning two eyes at me, two ears listening, and one mouth closed. You need some type of an attention management getting device Otherwise, the youngsters will take much longer than they need for you to bring their attention back. For purposes of this development uh, morning, we will just raise our hand. So, when I raise my hand, I would like you to raise your hand, and if the person sitting next to you is still conversing, it's your responsibility to bring the person back. Can you try that, please? Just raise your hand. Thank you so much. Okay. We're going to introduce yourself to one other person. Tell them your name, what you teach, and something personal about yourself. Do that now, please. It took us nine seconds. Now, if you have your students interacting, and it takes you nine seconds to get them back, and usually it'll take a little longer than that, but if it, let's say it takes nine seconds, and you do this a few times during the day, times the number of days in the month, we are wasting a lot of time just getting the kids' attention back. My guess is that we can probably do it less, in less than nine or 10 seconds. So please introduce yourself to a, the person sitting on your other side, Tell them your name, what you're teaching, and something personal. Do that now, please. Three and a half seconds. Now, what I have just done is given you an exposure to classroom management. What I did is I taught a procedure and then I challenged you in a positive way. I didn't say that's not good enough. I, said, I, would, I was positive. I bet we can do it better. And sure enough, we practiced it again. I reinforced it. This is classroom management, not to be confused with discipline. They are closely related. But they are two distinctive, distinct different subject areas. Classroom management has got to do with how things are done. Discipline has got to do with how people behave. Classroom management has got to do with structure, routines, and procedures. Discipline has got to do with self-control and impulse management. Classroom management is the teacher's responsibility, discipline is the youngster's responsibility. If you do not have good classroom management, 
your stress will be significantly high and your discipline problems are going to be high also. If you have good classroom management and a proactive discipline program, which is the topic of our in-service today, you will have reduced stress and students will become much more responsible. It is important to remember that if you have a particularly difficult day, to ask yourself, was it the, the curriculum, that is what we teach, did I make it meaningful or relevant to the students? Or is it a question of instruction? I had a great lesson plan, but I forgot what, how the students are going to learn. How involved were the students? Or was the classroom management? I had a wonderful lesson planned out with wonderful activities, but it took me 20 minutes to get the lesson going. Or was it a discipline problem? We're going to assume that. The, the, what the problems we're talking about today is not classroom management, but discipline. Let me give you just one or two examples uh, of classroom management. I would be talking to my students and all of a sudden I'd hear the pencil sharpener go on. What I would do is, I then taught a procedure. I had the youngsters take a pencil in their hand and when they wanted to sharpen it, they held it up. When I was finished with my sentence or my thought, I would then nod. I had some students who would all of a sudden crumble papers and for some reason the noise really bothered me. I just showed them how to take a sheet of paper and fold it in half lengthwise like a hot dog. It didn't make any noise and it didn't take any uh, room on the person's desk. Here's the point about classroom management. Process management precedes product. What you want to do is have your youngsters know and practice what you want them to do. Don't assume your youngsters know anything. Teach it. There are three principles which I strongly suggest you practice. The first one is positivity. It is amazing how many things come out of our mouths in a negative way that could be said in a positive way. For example, you go to the restaurant, which does not take reservations, and the maitre d' says, I won't have a table for you for 30 minutes. Or the maitre d' says, I'll have a wonderful table for you in half an hour. The maitre d' said the exact same thing, but how we interpret it is a whole different ballgame. The youngster wets his bed. So he has a challenge and the mother has a challenge also. So the mother says, don't wet your bed tonight. I would like you to reflect the last time you had a dream. Not that you remember your dream, but the last time you dreamt, if you pictured words, letters, text in your mind's eye, would you give me a mmm sound, please? If you, vi if you visualize images, pictures, scenes, would you give me a mmm sound? Isn't that interesting? Here is the point. The human brain operates by pictures. Remember, reading is a relatively recent activity in human development. The brain operates in pictures. And one of the things that we will do today is have youngsters create positive pictures in their minds. Because the picture that we have directs our behavior. Let's go back to the youngster who wets his bed. Instead of saying, don't wet your bed, the mother could say, let's see if you keep your bed dry tonight. The youngster doesn't visualize the don't, so what we do is we make it positive. Now, speaking about positive, let me share with you an experience that occurred to me after I returned to the classroom and 24, after 24 years, 
I returned to the classroom and the thing that just popped out at me was that I didn't think the youngsters of the current generation were as responsible as former generations. So that's what I started out to teach. And what I did is I found out that by promoting responsibility rather than trying to aim at obedience that the vast majority of young people want to be responsible. Now, when I returned to the classroom, after about two weeks, I found myself coming to school every day wearing a blue uniform with copper buttons. I was enforcing rules. I mean, we all we need to, to have rules, but they don't have to be negative. I was in a school district last spring in Los Angeles, and they had 15 rules, all negative because I think positively, I was able to change those negative to positive. Rules, standards are important, but there is a better term I would suggest than using rules. Rules are necessary in games. You've got to have them. But when you have rules between people, someone is going to feel as if they've got to enforce the rules and you will establish immediately an adversarial position. I found that rules are either expectations or they are procedures. And so I started to teach procedures and have high expectations. So Mary came late to class, period two. I asked her, Mary, what do you do before you come to period two? She said, I go to my locker to get my books for period two. I inquired, can you see yourself going to your locker before period one to get your books for both period one and period two? She said, yes. I then inquired, well, what else do you do before you come to my class? She said, well, I stop and wait for Jane. Mary, can you see yourself, picture yourself, walking right by Jane's classroom right here? She said, yes. Her number of tardies dramatically decreased. I could have said detention. I could have imposed a punishment. It would not have been nearly as effective if I established a visual procedure for her and help her, because Mary is right-brained, hem she's right hemisphere dominant. She does not work sequentially, chronologically, in an organized way. She thinks randomly, spontaneously, and unless she has some kind of structure, some kind of procedure, she can go to detention every week. It's not going to change her behavior. When something comes out of your mouth, ask yourself, is this going to be interpreted negatively or positively? Some of you asked about the book, Discipline Without Stress, Punishments or Rewards, How Teachers and Parents Promote Responsibility and Learning. Let me share with you the opening of the book. Life is a conversation. And the most influential person we talk with all day is ourselves. And what we tell ourselves has a direct bearing on our behavior, our performance, and our influence on others. In fact, a good case can be made that our self-talk creates our reality. When you are negative, your thinking is negative, just be cognizant of what you are doing. If you think positively and your inner chat is positive, it will be much more easy for you to communicate in a positive way. There's an awful lot of negativism going around, but you do not have to be negative. If you are consciously aware of the inner chat that you have has a direct bearing on how you relate to yourself and how you relate to other people. First principle, positivity. Before I say something, the first thing that now goes through my mind, because I've established new neural connections, is 
is this going to be interpreted negatively or positively? Let me go back for just a moment. When you introduce yourself to one or two other people, if you felt a little bit more comfortable after doing that, would you give me a mmm sound, please? Isn't that interesting? You really don't know the person, but you no longer are anonymous. You can have 15, 20, 25, 35 students in your classroom, and many of them can feel alone in a crowd. A change in behavior is as much emotional as it is intellectual. A change in behavior is as much emotional as it is intellectual. You know this from your own experiences. You know you should do something or should not do something. But it's only when the emotion kicks in that spurs you towards action. If you want a youngster who disrupts your class to change behavior, you want to be sure you tap into the youngster's emotions. So, let's go to the second principle I practice. Choice. If you were going to leave this session and could only remember two words, these are they. Choice empowers. Regardless of how small the choice is, if a person has a feeling of choice, it gives ownership. You will see that there are two requirements to change a person's behavior. One is awareness, and the second is ownership. When you give a homework assignment, just ask yourself, what options do the youngsters have? For example, instead of doing the pages or the problems on page five, perhaps you can assign the problems on page five or page six, or do the even numbers on page five, or the odd numbers, or so many problems from the ditto cheat or from the book. As long as the youngster has a choice, it, you'll find it amazing how much more successful you will be. You can prove this to yourself with a little experiment. Give your youngsters a classroom activity and then say, you can put the answers on the front or the back side of the paper. And you will see some of your kids are making a decision. Now they've forgotten about the, if they want to do the exercise or not, they're, they're focusing on here. Chances are, if you have a real problem with the youngster and the youngster really gets angry or you really get angry, it's because the youngster felt he did not have any options. He felt he did not have any choice. Now we always have a choice. Doing nothing is a choice. And we call it defiance. Third principle, after positivity and after the empowerment of choice is reflection. I would like you to think of one person in your life. It can be a parent, it can be a sibling, it can be a student, it can be anyone that, with whom you work, it could be a friend. And ask yourself this question. Have you ever changed that person? And if the person did change, did you do the changing or did the person change him or herself? If you believe you changed another person, would you please give me a mmm sound? If you believe the person changed him or herself, would you give me a mmm sound? A very sophisticated group. You realize, of course you can influence a person, but you cannot change a person. Think of anyone has ever changed you or if you change yourself. You can control a person, detention, time out, no television this evening, but you cannot change a person's thinking. You can control, but control is only temporary. If the gun is to your head, of course you'll do what the gunman wants you to do, but as soon as the gun leaves, you'll go back to what you want to do. You cannot force a person into wanting to do what you would like them to do. Benjamin Franklin pointed this out. 
when he was talking with King George III after the Stamp Act, and he said to King George, you cannot coerce people into changing their mind. Of course, it led to our revolution, and the same thing happens in the human spirit when you try to coerce people. Immediately, they are going to react negatively. You obviously can influence a person. And the most effective way to influence another person is in a non-coercive way. And the way to do this is through the skill of asking reflective questions. So often, what we do is we our normal approach is to tell somebody something. Now, if somebody tells you what to do, how do you feel? You like being told? Now, I'm not talking about sharing information. I'm being telling you to do something. What it does, it gives the implicit message, what you're doing is not good enough. You have to change. People don't like being told that they have to change. So it's coercive. Hence. This program will not tell people. It focuses in, focuses in on the only skill you need to hone in on, and that is the skill of asking reflective questions. Not long ago, I was in a session with some junior high people in Texas, and a vice principal said, we were having so many discipline problems that we started an in-house suspension room, and we were still having problems. So they started to video, to, uh, videotape the room just to see who was causing the problems. They then showed the videotape to the students. And the assistant principal, the vice principal, didn't understand why the kids' behavior changed. It was obvious to me. The kids saw themselves, saw how foolish they were, reflected, and straightened up. The key to in influencing someone to change is to have them reflect, because you cannot change another person. So those are the three principles I urge you to be conscious of, not only with your students, but with anyone. Be positive, be sure that they have some option, and if you want them to change, you've got to do it by having them reflect. Now, what are they going to reflect on in the discipline program? They're going to reflect on a hierarchy, a hierarchy of social development. Now, you are familiar with some hierarchies, like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're probably familiar with Jean Piaget's hierarchy of cognitive development. Some of you may be familiar with Lawrence Kohlberg, formerly of Harvard University's, his hierarchy of moral development. We are social people. We are in uh, school is in a social setting. I will be teaching a hierarchy of social development. I start out using Stephen Covey's first habit of highly effective people, and that is be proactive. Yes, I've been a counselor. Yes, I've been an administrator. But I am primarily a teacher. I teach. Instead of waiting until the youngster disrupts the class, and I react to it, I will teach, and this is what I teach. The hierarchy of social development starting with the bottom level, level A. Anarchy, where there is no order. Anarchy means A without, archy rule without rule. There's chaos. There is no order. Would you like to handle every discipline problem simply and easily? Want to increase your enjoyment of teaching? Want to reduce your stress? Hi, I'm Dr. Marvin Marshall, founder of Discipline Without Stress, a system that I developed from my personal experiences as a classroom teacher on the elementary, middle, and high school levels, as a counselor on all levels, and as an elementary, middle, and high school principal. Too many teachers rely on enforcing rules. Chances are that you did not come into education to become a cop enforcing rules. In contrast to coercive approaches, discipline without stress is totally non-coercive, but never permissive. The teacher is always in control. 
This is one of the many reasons the system is used by thousands of teachers in hundreds of schools around the world. You learn how to improve your classroom management, easily handle discipline problems, and use internal motivation to increase academic performance. This Discipline Online course is comprised of 54 laser-focused video segments showing how to always stay in authority without using coercive approaches such as bribes, threats, imposing punishments, or spending any time enforcing rules. This e-learning course is unique because it never expires. You can review, review any video at any order at any time. You will not find a more practical and inexpensive approach for improving your skills. Invest in this guaranteed system that will truly enhance your joy of teaching.